Welcome, Richard. We go back. I'm here with Richard Wade, who I would call, he'll he'll die when I say this, well, hopefully not, um, the health and safety and risk extraordinary is the guru, in my view. Uh, we go back, I don't know how many years. Is it back to 2007, 2008? It is. It's a long, long time, Lisa. You're right. Back, back end of then, about 2007, 2008 in York, the York, the York days. Yeah. The York Business Network, of which I still to this day, most of, the, most of my great friends and business contacts I established through networking. And I think networking is a little bit different these days. But um, so, and I've always known you to be in health and safety and in risk management, but I, I've always, I've never considered you boring. Oh, good. <laughs> That's a bonus. I'll take that any time, any day. And, and I've seen you uh, grow and develop what you offer over the years and the beauty of LinkedIn seeing, like I love seeing your videos of you in a farmyard. And one of the videos I saw not too long ago was that you did this. And I just thought, wow, you get to do this, where you'd been asked to test and measure the security of a farm. And you were saying, like, how, I mean, how many people would love to to be able to say and we stole a tractor and we stole this yeah. and we got it right down the track and nobody knew about it oh well, that was great that was really good fun yeah i just i just watched that and i thought god how did richard create a business where he gets to steal for a little it sounds like i've got an aspiration here to be a thief but um to steal and it be all in the spirit or all to help a a business have um the best and and right security in place whilst being safe so um so i've just loved your your updates Good. on on linkedin friday updates of where have you been yeah. and i just don't know how you've crammed it all in but the subject today that we're talking about is meant for more you know that i certainly remember when I realized I was working away for a hotel group, loved it. I'd worked my way up from the bottom. It's all I'd ever wanted. But there was a moment when I thought, God, I'm meant for more than this. And this has been my dream. But I do know I'm meant for more and what it takes to then work out what that is. And it's more meaning and more difference and more impact. But it takes a lot of courage and it takes yeah. uh, even to have the clarity. So I pose this question to you in the spirit of, knowing a moment when you felt like you were meant for more. Can you pinpoint times in your life and what that is? I can, yeah. There's, there's been a few, Lisa. And um, it's interesting that it goes back quite some time. It actually goes back. My, the first one, I put a bit of thought into this. So the first time I had that kind of moment, I thought, do you know what? There must be, I can do something else other than what I'm currently currently doing. I was still serving in the British Army and I was um, <clears throat> I was a warrant officer. So I was a warrant officer class two and I was an instructor. I, I had a really good job, cream, a creamy job. It was awesome. Um, and I loved my job. I was I was very good at it. I really enjoyed it. And I loved the army. I, I did 15 years in the British Army in the medical corps. What age? Time, what age did you go in? 16 I joined almost straight after school yeah um I left I left school this is in 1982 I left I left school after my O levels didn't do too clever on those but uh, I subsequently did them again by the way um left school in the middle of 82 and on the 7th of September 1982 I turned up at Keo Barracks in older shop with a little suitcase and a bag on, <laughs> bag on my back. And then I spent the next 15 years in the British Army and I loved it. It's awesome. And I'm really still close to that. Now we'll maybe come back to that later. What what I currently do that's still related to the army, which is very, very important to me. Um so I did that and stayed in the army 15 years. And this is going back to your question. In 1997. I got a random phone call from an old army buddy of mine. He's still a friend of mine and became a business partner of mine. You will have met him in, in the York days, Tony. We ran a business in New York together for 10 years. Anyway, he'd left the army. He was working for this insurance company in London called Lambert Fenchurch. And he said, right, he goes, um, 
are you happy where you are in the army? And I said, extremely happy. How can you not be happy doing what I do? I love it. He goes, yeah, but we're looking for someone just like you in our company. And I can get you an interview. And I really, I had, it wasn't on my agenda. I, I, I would plan that I'd at least do another seven years in the army and at the 22 year point, leave, get a nice big fat pension, get my feet up and, and do whatever. But it piqued my interest. So I started inquiring about, well, so what are you doing? And what did you do? And it, and it sounded all right. It was consultancy of safety and risk management, but not in green camouflage. They used to wear suits back in the day. I said, all right, I said, tell you what, get me that interview. Why didn't I come up and have a look and see what it's all about? And this is really quite funny. So he got me an interview. And I remember it really well. A Friday afternoon, I went up to London. I was living in, I had a house in Basingstoke at the time. And I was, army-wise, I was the oldest shot. Went up to London, went for this interview. And I got met by this fella, lovely guy. Two guys, Paul Welling and Matthew Bates. Ah, you're rich. I'm Richard. Yeah, welcome. Come on, we're off down the pub. Oh. I'm thinking, hang on, I'm in for, I thought I was going for an interview. Yeah, but we're, we're going to have a pint and buy it to eat first. So we went to the pub and we drank a couple of beers and we talked about cricket and football and all these things. Nobody said anything at all about safety and risk. And, you know, so what do you know about this, that and the other? Not once. And then we went back to the office and... Um, Right, OK, Richard, um, I'll see you out. This is Paul Welling, he's the main director. We get in the lift and we're going down to the basement. He says, um, so the job's yours. When can you start? <laughs> I'm like, what the hell's just happened to me here? Well, I got a free lunch and a couple of beers. Anyway, it got me, really got me thinking. And uh, so this is that first time that I thought, decision to make here. I've got a great job. I'm in the army. I love it. And I've got a house, live in Basingstoke. You know, I don't live on the camp, but pretty settled. What have I got to lose? So I did it. <laughs> I, I handed my notice in uh, on the Monday. I went and see my boss, Major Ian Crow, and said, oh, I've got a bit of news for you. Um, I'm leaving. He went, yeah, whatever sort, Major. Yeah, very, very funny. I went, no, no, seriously. <laughs> and this is true. Three weeks later, I was handing in my stuff and my ID card. And I left the army on the Friday, three weeks later, and I started my risk management, health and safety consultancy job on the Monday in a little briefcase, tolling up to London. It was dead funny. But that that was that first time where I thought I can do something differently. And, and as it turned out, it, it set me on that journey that was to become quite fascinating and fun and horrendous at times that, that I that is my life. So that was the first time, Lisa, of change do you um when you think about it when you were in the army so many people feel there's a fear about civvy civvy life yeah. and you know it, it, you feel institutionalized in the forces you know you know you, you know exactly where you stand with everything and exactly what's expected and you know your role how did it feel that um the noise in the background is Lexi she's the dog in the sunshine yeah um how did you feel uh yeah the dog <laughs> if you don't know me you don't know yeah. that moxie's a dog <laughs> clarify that. <laughs> Thank you. um how did you feel taking that step out of all that you'd ever known and into what must have to me this is projection of course like the big wide world of uncertainty was there a lot of fear did you feel like oh no i want to go in, in that space of of yeah. resigning and actually leaving in that gap, did your mind go, I'm doing it, I'm not doing it, I'm doing it, I'm not doing it, or did you yeah. just, yay? Well, I, so I've made the, it's, it, you make a very good point because you, the, the, the level of fear and trepidation was beyond anything I'd ever experienced. Going back to what you said about the military, you hit it right on the head. So any, any part of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, whatever it might be, you know where you're going to be at what time. You know what you're going to be dressed in. You know what you're expected to do and how you're going to do it. And if you don't, there's repercussions for that in some way, shape or form. So it's a very structured. You know what time you're going to have your breakfast, your dinner and your tea. And what time you're going to go and run and 
Okay. And let me, I just want to say, and those repercussions are not, uh, they are the same for everybody, no matter what they are. There's not some people get let off because they've got special yeah. circumstances. It's not a family. It is a very equal and level playing field, isn't it? Right. Everybody gets the same discipline, the same expectations, which is so different to the outside world. Absolutely. Sorry, no, no, it's a good point to make because it, it, it sets the scene that you know exactly the expectations are unequivocally clear. Yeah. No questions asked. But still brilliant. I'm not knocking at that. That yeah. that is brilliant and that's needed in that in that that kind of organization. There is no other way to be because the ultimate aim of that organization is war. Yeah. And in that scenario and of which I've been in three, and in that scenario. You don't want people questioning what you're telling them to do or where to. So there's a reason for it. The rationale is sound. But going back to that fear and trepidation. So I, on that Friday in July 97, I'm now, I don't have an army ID. I am absolutely petrified because of the unknown. But it was it was one of those scenarios where I had I had confidence in myself and my abilities to be able to go and do what I do what I needed to do but it was still a big unknown and so it was very 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 scary because I didn't know what was expected of me so I didn't know how I was going to be expected because the role was very clear you are now you're no longer a sergeant major you were on Friday but you're not now yeah you're not dressed in camouflage we can see you really clearly now and you <laughs> stand out and if you don't perform guess what we know you're not meeting your KPI and your metrics. So we know. So it's, it, it was scary. Anyway, talk to it like a duck to water. Me and my <laughs> mate. Well, we did. Because of the military attitude and the military training. So me, so we found myself, me and Tony, we um, we found ourselves as, he, he'd been out in the army probably about a year and yeah, about a year and a half, two years max at this stage. So he was kind of settled into the process and was doing really well. And he had risen above in a nice way the other guys in the team the team comprised i think it was about six or seven consultants all over the uk literally scotland all the way down to portsmouth tony had sort of nudged forward as this guy gets stuff done if you need a job doing why don't you ask tony tony can get it or he'll have a contact and then what i then joined tony and i knowing each other for many many years literally since 1982 um we suddenly became that that unit that inseparable unit and now we had an ally in, in the camp as it were and we really did well and our kpis were better we we found we had a knack for consultancy we could talk to people at any level that's down to the army you could be talking to a brigadier or a private soldier treat everybody the same and you'll do all right that's always been my mantra if i'm mm -hmm. talking even to this day if i go into any business or anywhere i will treat the guy who's sweeping the car park with exactly the same respect as the managing director or the global CEO of the organization, always and every time. And that, yeah, and because you can't go wrong, then can you? It's... You can't. And that's, um, I think that when people talk about when they describe people, they're usually describing their values, and that's your value of that respect for everybody and um just going back to um the army and that mindset that you have that i think is what people love it's that kind of what's the outcome and that your mind is because i was married to a pilot in the air force and i kind of have a little inside yeah. Uh, I've seen them in action when somebody's life was at risk, you know, a clam killer manjaro, my friend got malaria and she needed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I saw them in action and it's everything into plan A. There's no point talking about plan B. That's a waste of time. That effort could yeah. be put into plan A. Yeah. And so when I hear you speaking about, I can see why you and Tony did so well because the mindset is um, unwavering and yeah. unapologetic about the task. And it's about bringing people along with it, but you are really clear on the mission, the task, and it's all in on plan A. It's focus and it's alignment. And I can hear it in your voice. Well, it's so true. And and, and we did that for three years, you know, so 97 to 2000 with Tony and I, we, we, 
we very quickly be, we became not we weren't the leaders of the team because we had we had a boss a brilliant boss now if i can name him i'll name him now because he was a wonderful guy and he still is matthew bates lovely fella taught me a lot about the commercial aspect so you no long you're no longer a squaddy now richard you're not allowed to shout at people you got to, you know this that and the other there's a more subtle way keep your skills that you've got use them more subtly think more strategic really um get to know people he how to treat people was very much one of matthew's traits and i've always i've always stuck with that right to this day so in the year 2000 then this you'll know this place because it's it's not far from where, where you live so um eventually tony and i we we, we sh when we first kicked off uh, i left the army i was living in Basingstoke. Tony was in Derby, but eventually we ended up in York running our own business. So we decided that you were at right, Clifton it, Moor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Clifton Moor. Yeah, yeah exactly there. And um, what we decided in the Lambert Fenchurch days, it's probably worth mentioning. So you know that pub called the Cottage Pub in Haxby, Wigington. So yes. we're in there, right? We're having a Guinness, <laughs> and um, I don't drink anymore, by the way. But at the time I did, so we're having a Guinness. And Tony and I, um, we were talking about this, that, and the other. Yeah, and we got this coming up, and then we were really happy. And uh, again, it was really life was pretty damn good. We had a great job, and they looked after us. We had a good team, and we'd risen up. We had we had good respect in the team. People would come to us if they had issues or problems. Although we weren't the team leaders, we effectively became so. And we sat in the in the cottage pub, and uh, Tony went. Yeah, he goes, I've been thinking. He says, you know, um, I mean, you tend to kind of run the team, the show. We organise the events. That even that even had us recruiting the new guys to the team. Matthew gave us the job of being the recruiters and interviewing the new team members. So he said, you know, we do all that. We could probably do this for ourselves, couldn't we? And maybe do just as well and possibly even better. And he took, I remember that to this day, Tony gets his little pen out and he's, he's going, right, so we'd need this many customers and we'd need to earn this much money. So, yeah, I reckon we could do that. What do you reckon, Rich? I reckon we could do that. Good, let's do that then. So we went and handed our notice in. <laughs> we did. We did exactly that. There's a pattern in there. We'd, and, and we set up that business that, that you, you knew as as mm. part of on Clifton Moore in your corporate mm. safety solutions. Tony's yeah. still director of that business to this day. Hey. Yeah, he's, he lives down the road from me. We we get together fairly regularly and do stuff together still to this day. And yeah, that's what Amazing. we did. So we did so so it's again going back to your theme of meant for more. Well we were we'd we'd use that three years within the insurance company of developing our skills mainly our people's skills and our, our commercial acumen if you like to the point where we thought we are meant for more we, we're kind of we kind of peaked here now we've, we've moved up we, we can't we didn't run the show but we were in a position of responsibility with the respect of everybody up and down People relied upon us for various things, organising events, doing the recruitment that I just mentioned. So we were meant for more. We, we progressed to a position where we could now, go, what's next? I know what's next. And that's what we did. We set up that business. And we, and we stayed in that business, Corporate Safety Solutions, from the year 2000 until 2008 together. And then, and then we went our separate ways for various reasons. I'd moved further north uh, to the northeast. And we split the, the customer base and I took my main clients, Tony kept his main clients and off we went and did, did other things. Mm. But we still remain uh, friends together and we still do stuff together to this day. And I sense um, what I notice in how you're speaking is that backing yourself that you that each time you just back to yourself, what does it take? For those out there that um, are thinking of either setting up their own business or going for a different role or getting back into work or expanding their um, their offering, what does it take to back yourself? It takes um, it takes a bit of courage, but it, but but a little bit but more than courage. So you're going to need the guts to say, right, I'm going to do this. 
but it can't be blind courage. You have, you have to have thought it through. Like we said, with that, that bit of paper in the pub. So we need this many customers and this many days, and that will give us that. And if we do that, we will pay our bills and we'll be okay. So you need a plan. You do need a plan. Mm-hmm. But you still need the, the courage to make that giant leap of, I'm going to do it. And if you've got that courage, if you've got the courage, if you've made a plan and you've decided, well, that, that's going to work to the point where you're prepared to make that step, then you've just got to work all out. Stick to your plan. If your plan's robust and your plan's sound, it will work out. And there'll be knocks along the way. And, you know, we need this many customers. Some months you won't get it. So you'll have problems and you might struggle. But when that happens, well, that's where your business planning comes in because you should have thought of that already. Well, what if it doesn't work that way? What else are we going to do? So you, you need contingency. It can't be just blind, let's go and do it and hope it all works out. You, you need a plan and you need to have thought through, what if this plan actually doesn't work? Well, we'll do X, Y, and Z. But you mentioned something about plan B. I actually agree with you there. Don't have too strong a plan B because you won't be then focused on plan A. You'll be you'll be split between the two. Well, if it all goes wrong, I've always got plan B. Well, you kind of have, but hey, listen, get all your efforts, your energy and your time and your your networking. That's really important. We'll maybe come to that because I know you're a prolific networker as well. Get your networking and everything focused on your plan A and your plan A will work and you won't even need your plan B. Yeah, I have a saying, focus on plan A rather than failing to plan B. Um, And you're right. If you make plan B too appealing, then... And, and and it's knowing that difference of is this fear of a because it could be fear of I might fail, but also I think people's biggest fear could be I might succeed and I'm not used to succeeding yeah. at such a level or um, or what if what if I lose my friends if I'm successful I'll lose my friends or what if it means this there's, and but these sit under the under the bonnet they're less in our conscious thinking the more in our unconscious yeah. thinking driving what we do so people sometimes set this amazing goal running their own business with Tony and but then under the surface um start to shrink it they start to they shrink do. it because then they want to shrink it into something that they feel safer in yeah uh, you've hit it on the head that's the thing so I, I listen to all of your stuff by the way Lisa, and I know you often talk about self-limiting beliefs and, it, and it's an easy trap to fall into I'm not good enough oh I can't do that I could I've never done that before. And, and you can't, Pete, you can talk yourself into failure really, really easy. And you don't feel comfy. And well, you're not meant to feel comfy. Because if you're not being challenged, you're just sat around doing what you've always done. And that's going to get you what you've always got. Nothing's going to change, is it? So we don't, comfy is not a nice place to be. Challenge and risk calculated admittedly not just not reckless you can't be reckless well you, you couldn't ever be promoting reckless risk could you in in the no. expertise that you're in but i no. uh, <laughs> there's a saying isn't there that comfort is the enemy of growth yeah it's very true and and i wonder if it's comfort or familiarity so when i'm doing my empowerment exercises they're always there mm. to teach our mind another way of seeing something or recognize bringing it into consciousness so you know when you were going from um leaving the army to then going to work for that first company yeah that's the equivalent to the firewalk and then what yeah. goes on when you've signed up to do the firewalk and then when the firewalk comes on is people's mind yeah. goes i'm doing it i'm not doing that i can get out of it i'll break my leg i'll pray for rain um that their mind is going backwards and forwards. It's like a seesaw backwards and forwards all the time about whether they're going to do it or not, how they can get out of it. Oh, yes, I am going to do it, even on the night. But when it comes to doing some of the other exercises that we do, such as the arrow break with our throat, yeah. people will always try, and they'll do things like they'll try pushing their throat. And I'll say, why are you trying to recreate something that you don't know yet know? And then you're yeah. going to make a decision based on something that's not the same. Um that's based on an assumption yeah. and and they'll say well it hurts and I say does it hurt or does it feel unfamiliar because yeah. whatever label we give something will determine how we feel about it and then what action we take and like oh yeah it's just that's unfamiliar so and so what else in your life is unfamiliar that you're putting down as um 
not right or fear or change or um, um you make some great points and i've I've watched your fireworks and i've watched those um things on the nets and it makes it's such a great point to make because if when you're in your comfort zone i actually think you're in the danger zone yeah. because because often in business your comfort zone is reliant on other people's activities and actions and you have no control over those so that's a to me that's a danger zone because if i'm comfortable because i've got this client that client and the other client and life's peachy and oh isn't this nice and then one day their business gets sold or they go bankrupt or suddenly your comfort zone is ripped from under your feet and it, and now you're in a real danger zone so anyone who's in a comfortable position i would say have a look at how comfortable it is and if it's comfortable because of your own control and direction, then that's true comfort. But if it relies on any external factors that you don't control, that's not comfort. That that's dangerous. But um, probably your, complacency your... as well. Yeah, comfort yeah. allows complacency yeah. and and actually that yeah. feeling of being able to sleepwalk through life. So many of us. Um, yeah. I enjoy sleepwalking where we don't have to think too much. We're just on autopilot. And it's another way of us numbing ourselves out these days. Whereas when we come to set up our own business or change our job, it really requires us to be awake in our consciousness. And that can give us, you know, that can exhaust us, but it's. uh... Yeah. I think, I think you've got to embrace that, embrace the, embrace the risk, plan plan the risk, embrace the change. And, and really, have faith in yourself step out of that comfort zone and yeah it's good i think it's good to be a little bit uncomfortable it it will give you that edge it will give you that hunger to keep moving forward and striving for whatever it is you might might need to go towards but it will make you do the hard work along the way because nothing's easy nothing comes easy You, you only get stuff if you plan for it and then you work hard you look at all those big gurus look at your Bransons and uh, and your Bezos and all those those guys haven't just landed there by default they have worked absolutely tirelessly and then brought in the other people who can do the stuff that they can't do because you can't do everything obviously uh, but it's great it's hard it's having a plan having direction um, and go for it but it doesn't always work out though does it so can I tell you a little story about I yeah. thought oh this would be a good idea and then it didn't it wasn't it was awful <laughs> And it went horrifically wrong twice. Oh, we definitely want to hear that. <laughs> that, um, that that business that Tony and I ran for a while, when, when we went our separate ways, Tony carried on running uh, corporate safety. I set up another little bit in York again uh, to the, at the start, another little business called Safety Compliance Services. One year in, I got purchased. I got bought out um, by a very large, well-known UK health and safety and risk management and insurance company. And they basically, they bought my client base. I'd won a huge contract with a care home company, 300 care homes that we were auditing, me and a little team of people. Anyway, we got purchased. And at the back end, <laughs> at the back end of 2010, um, I found myself with not a lot to do because I didn't have a company anymore. So I was in between things and an opportunity came up that again, I, I, I took it. And, th- and this was to move to New Zealand. So mm. for, again, this is a, the theme is here. It's an old army mate of mine. He's still in New Zealand now. He was the best man at my wedding. I was the best man at his wedding. Anyway, we were chatting away on this particular day. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a company. And he said, well, what are you going to do now then? And I said, I have no idea. I, I, I haven't really thought about it yet. He goes, well, why don't you have my job? He, he was in New Zealand as the regulatory manager in local government, at Ashburton District Council on the South Island. And he just got himself a new job at Tasman, a little bit further north. He goes, you should go for my job. He goes, you, I'll get you an interview. See the pattern that's occurring here. He got me an interview, did this interview over Skype. And they offered me the job. So they said, right, so this back end of 2010, right, so yeah, we'll, we'll let you be our new regulatory manager, but you need to be here in New Zealand, ready to work by April 2011. Is that enough time? Yeah, I didn't have a clue. I don't know if that was enough time. I went, yeah, that's plenty of time. I had to get all my medicals and new police checks and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, so that's this. This is now my plan. Oh, this is going to be exciting. We're going to go to New Zealand. Yeah, can't wait. In February of 2011, you recall that huge earthquake that kicked off in Christchurch. Christchurch is 40 minutes north of Ashburton, by the way. We're, we're about to go and live. So I've already got trepidation and fear now. But anyway, the tickets are bought, so we might as well go. I passed my police checks. Medical was all right. Off we went. So we went to New Zealand thinking this new life's going to be peachy and awesome. And it wasn't. It wasn't peachy and awesome. It was... Um, I had a nice job. Life was OK. But OK is not good enough. O OK I ain't going to cut the mustard. So... Two and a half years later, came home. Why was it? Um, why was it just okay? What was it that? What ingredients did it not have that you need that to stimulate you or to make you happy? Me and my family, and um, distance from everybody you've ever known in your life and loved, really? and who you see on the weekend and who you go to football with and parties with and go for a pint with suddenly gone you got it all over there but it's different and you know it the country is beautiful the people are beautiful but it wasn't for us it didn't didn't fit our our sort of model of life and operating one of my boys was born out there by the way my really? youngest, yeah my youngest son adam was born in ashburton hospital uh, you didn't get dual nationality that all changed quite a few years ago so that's one of those things again where again it's on the theme isn't it made for more mm. it ain't always going to be how you think it is but then that so that then leads you to think so okay well what you get so what so it hasn't worked out so now what well yeah. you've got to be resilient and think i'm gonna to have to do something else well that's what we did we and did how something. was it moving back then it's all right it's quite it was did you keep quite, your house did you rent your house yeah, when you went, yeah, yeah it, it, it'd been rented out and um so it, it was it wasn't traumatic it was a lot to do it was busy it was yeah. you know bringing a family back from new zealand yeah but we did fly emirates so that was good that, that's really good. <laughs> uh, emirates i love that honestly they're just fantastic <laughs> yes yeah, so we came back um but I, I mentioned a minute ago there was two two of these events that that went horribly pear-shaped so this is really weird actually so we're now back in the uk and I'm kind of fishing around for what I'm going to do. I got an opportunity from a friend of mine called Paul Muir. He said, well, while you're doing nothing, why don't you come and help us out? We need a teacher in Nigeria, in Lagos. Yeah, all right, then. I'll, I'll do that for a bit. When I did a bit of health and safety teaching in Lagos, in Nigeria, uh, in Acadia. That was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Did that for a little while. And then another friend of mine, ex-army guy called Richie O'Neill, he, he, he gets in touch. He goes, ah, we've got a project coming up. This time it's in Liberia. So if you think about the timelines are really important now, it's about 2013 or so. Um, Liberia, yeah, oh, it's dead easy. It's a great job. We go to Africa, fly over into Monrovia, and then you jump in the vehicle. Off you go up to the this place called Yakepi, and um, we're the safety guys, but we'll do a rulement because I'll be out there for so five or six weeks and then I'll go home and then you come out and oh that's good it was for a company called Thyssen Krupp big German industrial company and this looks wow and it was a wild job the pay was unbelievable and the perks were like wow this was going to change my life financially forever so we thought wow. going back to resilience in a minute so did a bit of thinking, right? So my my in-laws live in France. So and that's where they retired when, when they left here in Newcastle. They went to France, lived and still there now. So we thought, right, so I'm gonna have to fly to Monrovia every now and then. Why don't we go and live in France for the duration of this project? That's what we did. So we went high, uh, rented a property in a beautiful place called Belle Arbre. It's um in the Indra, Department 36 in France, about I don't know. Three, say three hours on a train south of Paris, countryside, beautiful, wow. And the plan is, we're now there. I've got this job with Tiss and Krupp, and I'm going to be going to Monrovia and coming back. Because the job didn't require us to be, we could have been anywhere. Could have lived in Moscow, could have lived in Amsterdam. We, we said, let's go make an adventure of this. Went to France, rented this house <laughs> of Jean-Claude, wonderful guy. And um, 20 minutes from my mother and father-in-law, 
So we were in Belle Arbor. They live and they still do in Lignac. Um, and then this thing started happening in the world. So I'm due to go out in the September uh, of 2013. This new disease in Africa, it was called the Ebola virus, starts to kick. And we're like, oh, that's that's where I'm going. He said, oh, this is getting a bit scary. A bit risky. Ooh, was it? Anyway, so, we, so now my risk antenna is that richie's out there by the way he, he's there he, he's on site he, he's doing his safety stuff and the plan is in september i think this is about may june or whatever plan is i'll be going out for my first six week stint in the september time bowler starts spreading hundreds of people start dying the world in that in the african world starting to close down it's getting da- more and more dangerous now i was on a retainer at the time so i was getting paid so many euros to sit in France and have barbecues waiting for my turn to go out and, and do the room with Richie. So there was no financial issues at this stage, but then it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And now I'm starting to panic a little bit. And then, then my fear came to, came to fruition when they did project stop, which is what we've been scared about right from the get go. As we started to hear about Ebola, what Project Stop meant was all your contracts are cancelled. You no longer work for Tiss and Crook. See ya. Oh, here's where resilience comes in. So now you find, this is me, now you find yourself in France, in a rented property, with a family and no job, no income. It's like, oh, this is a bit scary. <laughs> what, what are we going to do now then? Well, that's where your resilience really kicks in. Do you want to know what I did? But yeah, I do. Yeah, so um, I thought, right, what's my immediate problem? Your immediate problem is you live in France in someone else's house with two children. Remember, the one, one was born in New Zealand. We, we actually took one out with us. It was ours. We took another one, someone else's random kid we took with us. So we've now got two kids unemployed in France. Now, I speak quite good French, by the way, but I'm not fluent. And there's no way in the world I could ever get a job in technical risk management and safety in in France. Never. I might have got a job maybe washing coffee cups in the local cafe or something. (laughs) So I needed a job. And it was really it was a really scary, scary time in my life. So what I did, I started fishing around and I saw I saw a job advertised. This is going to sound crazy, but it's true. I saw this job advertised in Loughborough near Leicester. Yeah at Charmwood Borough Council, and they were looking for an interim health and safety manager. And I thought, hang on, I got, got onto Google. I'm looking at the maps. So we weren't a million miles. So we were in Belle Arbre, and our local airport was Limoges, and that was about 40 minutes away. And there was two flights from Limoges into the East Midlands Airport. I thought, oh, that, that could be quite good. So, I, yeah, let's have a look at that then. Checked out the job. Sent my CV in and they went, we'll interview you, over you come. So off I went down to Limoges on whatever the day was and then um, went to Charmwood Borough Council, got interviewed and they went, yeah, we we like you, you can have the job. (laughs) I went, oh, okay, I've got a job, excellent. I'm now now employed. Ah. I've got to go back to France. Oh, by the way, I've got nowhere to live in England, in Loughborough either. So I then had this frantic period of my life where I had to sort loads of stuff out. But fast forward to the start of 2014, um, Ebola is now a long distant memory. I don't care about that anymore. That That's something I've learned along the way, Lisa. Get the past out of my life. You can't change it. You can't alter it. It's wasting your time if you're thinking about it. You can't do anything about stuff that's happened. Deal with the stuff that you can control. Um, I'll mention another guy, when I, if I may talk about stoicism shortly, but back to where I was. So um, I, I then... Go... I love that, though. That is a real kind of full stop exclamation mark. Get the past out of your life. Oh, you can't change it. Uh, um... So many people live in that zone that's irrelevant oh but you did that but you said that and then so what you're gone forget it what are you going to do tomorrow what are you going to say tomorrow what you 
you've got to be looking forward. And I, and I think it's so important to have your mind. You, you know, we talked about mindset, haven't we, quite a bit. And, and thinking forward and planning and maybe taking a bit of risk. And one of the key aspects that will allow you to do that, you, as you know, far better than I is, forget anything that's gone. It's, you, you're wasting your, all the effort that people spend whinging about stuff that's gone wrong in the past. And they, oh, if only I had a, should have done this, would have, should have, could have. Judge Judy said, should have, would have, could have. Judge Judy, <laughs> the mentor that is. I am, do you think how much of, um, of the army... Because uh, that's a real, I think that's a real kind of, um, I hear quite a lot of army uh, framework in your mind, like um, what's yeah. my immediate need or what's my, like, what's my immediate risk? What's my immediate threat? Um, what's yeah, it's and it's all about yeah. resourceful thinking, is it? What are my needs right now? And yeah. what's, what's the quickest route to it? How much of the army do you think, oh. which is, is, that and the way that they teach you to think and be which is very present isn't it unless you're collecting like where can we improve what we did yesterday and put it into tomorrow how much of it is down would you say has helped you be the success you are thousand percent one thousand percent no question about it so you um you joined the army as i did young kid 16 years old you didn't really know what's going on in the world you're almost you're almost fresh out of school you know you're, you're a baby and then you spend your formative life learning discipline procedure trust teamwork thinking of others that's the key thing so within the, the military ethos isn't about you the individual the military ethos is about your team and the people who ultimately will keep you alive in the event of you have to do what you've signed up to do, you know? So that's really important. So that that will stick with you for the rest of your life. So uh, anyone who's gone through the military train, it's not for everyone. Loads of people fall along the way and people get in trouble and, and get kicked out or they commit crimes because, you know, the army is not all brilliant. The army is a, it's a cross section of society. So mm -hmm. in there, you've got everything you find in any city in the world. You've got, criminals naughty people all of those but those that stay and do well in the military they at some point they will leave that's the one thing that's a guarantee you join the army and at some point you're going to go out and if you've done okay in the military army navy or air force i think you're going to kind of do okay in whatever you do because you'll have a set of values and a set of attitudes that aren't all about you they're about the bigger picture and other people. And, and that's really important It's yeah, to know that it's about other people as well. Ultimately, that helps you because you've got a great team. You've got people who, who rely on you, trust you, respect you. Well, they'll go out of their way to do stuff for you. And, they, and it's everyone as well, really. So the Army, going back to your direct question, is 100, 1,000% instrumental in everything I have done since no question about it mission I, focus I just yeah mission focus and I can just <clears> really I mean and and I know you love doing what you do now but I also think um there's a talk in there about those those learnings from the army and how if we apply it to today's business leadership and teamwork would I mean I think I think we'd all benefit from a year's military training. Well, I know someone. If you want to go in for a bit, I can get I can get <laughs> get you a spot. Are they taking fifty five year old five foot one women? Oh, I'd have to double check on that. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they're probably not. Please tell me they're not. Um, they're not. But, um, <laughs> but I think um, I, I think we could. I think sixteen year olds would ultimately their future self would be so grateful to their 16 year old version self going through military training for a year or two years a lot of them would a lot of them would hate it a lot of them would, well, they definitely... a, lot, a lot wouldn't thank you because they have to tidy the room exactly and and <laughs> imagine and imagine not being able to be on your phone if you want to distract yourself or yeah, exactly yeah. i think but i think the world needs it i re... it's just i suppose i'm an old-fashioned girl but i see um 
so many people searching for comfort and that's not bad it's just you have to make sure you search for it in the right places at the right times looking at not being um so many people are frightened of their own power so when um or they want to normalize things because they're not used to their just their potential and um so um yes i think there's a talk in there and I think, and are you, um, I do want to know two things as well. And I'm yeah. in a bit Tourette's, see, bear with That's me. That's cool. No, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you done a talk? Have you created a talk? Because if we watch this back, there is a brilliant talk in it. Well, I haven't done a talk as such on the, those lines. I do a lot of talking and I do a lot of teaching. Yeah. I do, and I, I have an online school, and so I, I look, but I love this kind of thing, and because I've learned a lot of things along the way, and it hasn't always been easy. It's basically quite the opposite. Those times that we're talking about there, you know, the bit in France, the New Zealand, and there's been some really, really tough times. But um, I think what I've what I've kind of learned along the way is that you expect bumps in the road, and just roll with the punches. I, I mean, I was going to mention this stoicism thing, and this has helped me a lot. You know, I, I I'm part of a very large military network on LinkedIn, and it's called the Gen Dit Network. And there's a guy in there. His name's Chris Kirk. He's an ex Royal Marine commando. He's a lovely fella. I've met him a couple of times um, within that network on a face to face basis on events that we run in Bristol. Last one we did in Bristol. Not it's not my event. Sorry, that came across one. Well. The event that they run that I attend, last one, face-to-face networking event, 600 people. Ooh. Bristol Football Stadium. There's another one coming up next year in March. It'll be even bigger. It's huge. But this fella, Chris, Chris right, he's into stoicism, <clears throat> and he's used it throughout his military career. And I've been studying this quite a lot uh, of late. I'm no, no expert by far, but the principle of get, get in your own lane, and don't worry about what other people think about you because you can't influence it and control it to an extent just be you if you just be yourself and be nice and do whatever you're going to do people can think what they like they might love it or they might hate it but it doesn't matter because you're being your authentic self so just be you he he says keep in your own lane he actually doesn't use these words he uses strong words and don't really care too much about what other people think about you and that will stand you in very, very good stead because it allows you to get all of the noise out of your life and focus where you're going on what's really important. Forget what's behind you. Forget the noise around you and just focus on where you're going. And you'll get probably have a better chance of getting there. It's perfect. It's it's kind of what I teach in my um, workshops that I do in companies yeah. is so often people are seeking um, acceptance or validation or um, wanting to be the same as the people next to them. And what I teach in there is that they can't chat to each other because they've got to be really focused. And usually when there's a firewalk or an arrow break or they know they're in a different environment that needs all of their focus. So I help them have an experience for eight hours where they're practicing the way I want them to consider thing. I'm not just talking to them about it. They're actually in the experience of being able to muscle memory recall, uh, memory recall, yeah. what it's like to be totally focused and in the now. And you there isn't time to worry about what other people think. That's really important. Um, yeah. yeah, there's and not I've, enough and I've experiences. Watched them. I've, yeah. I've watched, I've watched them. So the ones that you do, I, you know, I've watched, as I said before, I've, I've seen them. And you can see the initial fear on people's faces. And then, then they get in that mindset. They, they're then... The, the decision has been made, I'm going to walk across the fire or I'm going to snap the, the stick on my neck or whatever it might be. And at that point, that's that's where they're stepping into that unknown zone. But the second they've done it, well, I think I've seen people burst out crying. Oh, on some, absolutely. On some of your, it's like, wow, I've done it. Wow, look how good I am. And it, that will give them that belief that you, you advocate, you know, that self-belief and you can do it. And I think... Yeah. That's that resonates throughout life. You you can do it. It's what you're telling convince, yourself. Yeah, you've got to convince yourself you yeah. can do it. And and what I bring yeah. to to any business or workshop room is I bring the external um 
stuff to a head, the stuff that people are having to overcome, the stuff that people are moving through in their own mind. I bring it so it's live in the room and their mind has a model, you know, and it's teaching commitment, discipline, focus, containment, contain yourself. And yeah. noticing when do you start numbing yourself out and when do you start um, infecting people around you? So I love, I love it what your, um, I've forgotten his name, the stoism chap. Chris, Chris Kirk. Chris, I love what Chris says, stay in your lane. Don't worry about what other yeah. people think because what yeah. the people think about you is what they think about themselves. Yeah, so exactly. it's actually never about you. You're just the, you're just the best, um, the valve that it's been released through and it, um so the um and also the things that i've noticed in what you've said is you are because you're so in the now you're so in the resourceful space of thinking and being and an action that you are so flexible but you've also got self-trust and you back yourself so yeah, um to. you said um something about you don't drink anymore no i don't know so what if i may i mean i'm what? 16 i call it 16 years sober um what what uh, was your reason for not drinking uh, interesting and i'm glad you that? mentioned that well this is all linked in so it, it goes back to this this fellow chris kirk actually so the first networking event in the gen Deer was a couple of years ago uh, that was the first one actually at the Bristol Football Stadium. Um, we all pitched up, say hundreds of people. It was brilliant. What a fan. It was really good. Loads of light. My, let, let's come back to the agenda and, and mention the, what that's about because it's really important actually. Thanks. And anyway, so I'm down at this, this event at a fantastic event, all these workshops and people getting helped with housing, mental health issues, job searching, CVs, you name it. It's all about helping people who need help and signposting that all finished that was a brilliant day and then we all go down to the pub we go to the Weatherspoons, and i'm drinking my guinness and i'm getting a little bit tipsy and everyone's getting tipsy but not chris kirk and I, I, my, my brain collared that but he was still having a great time he was still yakking away and later on in the evening we're all drunk but not Chris Kirk, but he's still having a great time. And I'd, I'd noticed, I thought, that's really weird. He's an ex-commander, a bootneck, a Royal Marine commando. And he's sitting there with his flipping orange juice and a little umbrella in it or whatever. We didn't have an umbrella in it. But... Not in Weatherspoons, he didn't. <laughs> that, that just struck me as quite odd. Anyway, I remember uh, a little while later, I didn't say anything at all, but it, it, my, it had been logged in my, in my memory bank there. And a little while later, we're having uh, some kind of conversation via LinkedIn. And I mentioned it in, in a message. Oh, I noticed you weren't drinking. I never drink. Never seen the never seen the point of it. And that really got me interested. I thought, hang on a minute. There's a roughy toughy commando there. And he doesn't drink. And he's really got his act together. He's the one who's like, capable at the end of the night he he knows how to get a taxi he's first up in the morning and all i thought that's quite anyway so i started reading but now i i didn't i was drinking quite a bit i used to love my guinness and red wine you know oh i love it i was a professional drinker for 40 years lisa i'm telling you <laughs> and i was good i should have got a medal instead i got a <laughs> headache and um big big fat cheeks anyway uh, i started reading loads of literature um quit lit as they call it and i started following people on podcasts and i really started getting an interest in it. i thought oh there's something in this that so with my my life regular drinking and i mean regular every night i'd have a glass of wine or two and at the weekends i'd have a good old skin full of guinness so i've got really got thinking about how am I present? How am I? How am I showing up for the world in my, with my family and my and my business? And the truth of the matter was, I was showing up tired, bloated, and not really on top of my game. That was the truth of the matter. And so I thought, well, you're nearly sixty now, and if you can't, I, I, I'm fat. Funny, I'm fifty nine in two weeks' time. So, but I'm, I always 
I'm nearly 60. That's, that's all I think. <laughs> I'll get me on my pension when I'm 60. So I've got something to look forward to. So <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you're nearly 60 now. So you can carry on having a couple of glasses of wine a night and plenty of Guinness at the weekend. And the outcome ain't going to be you're going to wake up with a six pack and a, and a, and a, a 10, 10 minute run. Or The outcome is you're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and lazier and lazier. And you might have a heart attack. Oh, right. So I had, I had some really serious talking to myself. So I decided, right, well, why don't you stop drinking for a little while and see how you feel? And so I did that. Um, let me go to, while we're talking, I'm going to go to my, I've got an app on my phone, by the way. Yeah. And so I started just to see how I would feel by not drinking. So in the first week, I felt awful. I couldn't sleep, I had night sweats. And I thought, oh, this is horrendous. I'm even, I'm even more tired now. And I haven't, I haven't even got a hangover. So it's all it was horrible. And I get to the end of the month, and I'm starting to feel... Uh, there was an epiphany. I woke up one morning and I went, wow. Well, you probably know, you because you, you... I went, that's what it's like to sleep properly then. I had this. I had the sleep of a baby. I, and I woke up and I felt so fresh and energized. I thought, "Wow, this is nice." So I kept it going, and then I started exercising, and then real change in my life started to happen. I found on a Saturday, instead of wanting to do this, that, and the other, and going to have a couple of pints in in my club. I'd be playing basketball with my boy, Lewis, mm. or we'd be off a live near a beach. I could be down the beach. We could be kicking the ball. These little things that I now realise I've been missing out on because I was drinking were starting to come into my life, and I was starting to lose loads of weight. I've lost two stone, by the way, over the period of time. Mm. And my fitness levels have gone up. And the energy that it's given me is just unbelievable to the point where next week, I launch another business next week. We can maybe mention that at the end. It's not about, sorry, it's not about that though, but it's Tell me what the is the business? Well, I, I don't want to turn this. I'm really enjoying this. I'll mention it. I'll mention the name and we'll leave it there. It's called mediczone.co.uk. But I don't want this to be about, I want okay. this to be about your theme of, of change and being. And and make, but it sounds to me like having another mensch creating another business is all is all part of you always looking at how you can improve more how you can yeah. adapt more but right back to then your energy because i totally but, relate to all but, of I, but i'm so glad you mentioned the, the non-drinking thing because it, it, again it's one of those it has been one of those meant for more moments i didn't know it at the time i was just going to stop for a few weeks a month to see how i feel well and now i will show you my app this is the app that i use here it's called i am sober oh and what yeah and what it what you do you, it's free by the way there is a paid version but i've never paid for it and so it sends me a little it goes ping and i go oh i am sober wants to have a look at me so i open it up and it says to me richard you have been alcohol free for one year, three months, 26 days, four hours, one minute and 26 seconds oh. or 27 seconds or 28 seconds. That, that bit keeps changing <laughs> yeah. you know, as you would expect. But then you press another button and it says, oh, guess what? You also haven't spent £4,840 <gasps> on beer. That's just the beer, not the taxis and the kebabs. And But this is the other bit. This is why it's life changing when you stop drinking. It tells me. Richard, you also haven't sat there drinking Guinness for 2,420 hours. That's three months of time not sat guzzling beer. That's that, three months of starting a new business. It's Going three months football. of being with Lewis. It's three it, it goes to play football or basketball yeah. or, or decorating or doing your gardening or waking up thinking, Wow, I feel really fresh today. Yeah. Shall we go? Let's go to the Lake District. Yeah, come on, jump. The other thing is, you can always drive, as you know, you yes. can always, don't you, any time of the day or night. Um, this came to fruition when Lewis's chain came off his bike and he wasn't that close. On a Saturday, he wasn't that close to home. Now, normally, he wouldn't even phone me because he knew I'd be having a Guinness. So I'll, yeah. 
Dad, my chains come off. I'm on my way. Where are you? It freedom. I tell you, one of oh, the man. things that I because I well, I'm interested in you now, Lisa. I, well, I, I would drink every night, and I and it became yeah. a norm at seven o'clock. I would make sure I had two bottles of wine in the fridge. One I would definitely drink in just in case, and I, I wasn't. <laughs> And I, I wouldn't. I would never put my glass yeah. down because I had two yeah. retrievers. So that is probably why I would never put my glass. Yeah, down. yeah. So yeah. I and and what I I was yeah. doing my first ever motivational talk in two thousand and eight, and I thought I am. I don't feel confident. So I went on a detox for a month to lose weight. So yeah. I felt like I would be. And with that, the detox was cutting out salt, sugar, wheat, dairy, eggs, potatoes, yeah. caffeine, and alcohol. And at the end of the month, I thought, for as long as I don't miss it, I'm not going to drink it. And that was just my rule. If I don't miss it, I'm not going to drink it. But I'm going to be like really clear with myself about am I missing it or not? Or is it is it the alcohol I'm missing or is it the socializing I'm missing? But like you've said, that waking up feeling fresh, I didn't know that that kind of wake up existed. I, I know. It's like, oh, that's, that's, that's weird. And sleeping through the night, like you say, and... um. Yeah, and the energy for the next day and the focus. and But what I love the most is I love my freedom. And so that freedom of being able to jump in a car anytime for anyone, or if I'm going to a black tie dinner, I can say to my friends, I'll pick you up and then I will drop you off. Oh, you can't drop us off. It's just too many of us. No, that's the perk. For me, that's the runs. perk. Do what yeah. you want, yeah. whenever you want. The other, I don't know if you noticed that. The, the other thing I've noticed this is me what i uh, it's given me clarity and consistency so I, that's the key thing so if i think back to when i was having my guinness and all the rest of it i didn't know if i was going to wake up in the morning grumpy tired slovenly i know how i'm going to wake up now full of beans rearing to go i've got i know where i'm doing the next day and i know i'm going to do it i've got clarity and consistency and that's all because of not drinking i i'd advocate it for anybody but this it comes with some funny things doesn't it so i still go to my club they've now got alcohol free guinness zero percent guinness in there for me and guess what loads of other people drink it as well i love it it's amazing that. and how other people react to when you start drinking it is fascinating to me fascinating and so, and I had a conversation. I'm not going to name the phone. I had a conversation with, with an associate. He, he also runs a, a company like mine, a safety company. And we're chatting away yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we should maybe get together for a beer. And I said, oh, I don't drink anymore. And there was like this silence. Oh, he's ex military as well. That's a bit weird. Oh, it's not weird. It's brilliant. He thought, never. No. And I, and I did the same thing I've just done. You got me up out. And, uh, and he used my old joke of seconds changing. Blah, blah, blah. That would never never get old. Um, he couldn't get his head around it. But he then did what everybody does. They then tell you how much they don't drink. <laughs> how they haven't got a problem with drinking. Oh, I only, uh, And I said to him, oh, no, I didn't ask you. Yeah. I'm not interested. I don't care how much you drink. Like, it's nothing to do with me. You go, yeah. go fill your boots. I don't care. It's not my problem or issue. And I'm not that interested in your drinking habits. But they, they want to tell you how they. It's very fascinating. Oh, it is. All, all that people think that um, people instantly think that I must have had a problem. Now, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I didn't stop because I had a problem. I stopped. Same. Life gave me the opportunity, and I <laughs> ran with it because in it my is. family. Yeah. My mum was an alcoholic, my stepmom's an alcoholic, my dad, my stepsister, my sister. And I had this opportunity where I wasn't missing it. I thought life does not happen like this does not happen like this. I'm a lucky girl that I am not yeah. struggling every day not to have a drink. And so, um, but then the other thing is I didn't get invited out in the same way as I used yeah. to get invited out. My life is much cleaner. I'm not destructive because uh, I had a yes. destructive aspect to my nature because of my upbringing and my yeah. programming. Um, and I've got a much more peaceful, calm and quiet life. And, and I love your app because what your app is reminding you all the time is this is how much value not yeah. drinking is worth so it if you think knows. about drinking this is this is what's in jeopardy yeah. or That's you can. True. it's not that you can't but you can and i think i do think it's interesting um 
when people are like, oh, you're not drinking. Well, I won't. Like, oh, um, yeah. or the other thing is they say, oh, well, I don't want to tempt you. And I get, I actually get, and I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I get really annoyed when people think that what they do will influence me. I know exactly. It's what I, I, you, first of all, what you swallow has no impact on me. And secondly, I've got my own reason, my own purpose and my own um, value around it that you couldn't possibly make a difference to me. Exactly. And it's, it's just going back to what I mentioned earlier. It's just being in your own lane. And it doesn't, people, people I don't mind, people drink, it doesn't bother me. People get absolutely wasted. It doesn't bother me yet because it's not my business. I don't. It's not that I don't care about people. I don't I'm going. To that don't theme. impose. Exactly that theme of look whatever you're doing. I don't control what you do, think or feel. So therefore, I'm not really going to let it get any space. It's not living rent free in my head. What you do, I don't, so it's irrelevant. I'll just get on with my own stuff and do what I need to do. And I think that's the way to look at it. But I'm so glad I did it. I, the real, f I, will, I, will, I have a funny feeling I will never drink again in my entire life. And the reason I know this to be a fact is because I've been through, as you have, mm. we've been through those key milestones that typically we would associate with drinking alcohol, and probably to excess. So I've been, so I packed in in the June, in the August, guess what? Holiday in France. Do, 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 do. Oh, before that was red wine, cheese, and beer time. <laughs> Not, that was really difficult, but I won't lie to you. That was really, really tough. I nearly came close, but I thought I, I learned to play it forward. Yeah, okay. So you can have a glass of wine. What's the benefit of that? And how are you going to feel tomorrow? And more importantly, you're going to have to set your app back to zero. You're going to have to start all over again. Imagine that now, all those thousands of hours and, and calories. I, it, I, I, the thought of it, I didn't mention the calories. You're not going to believe this, right? I guess I'm 968,000 calories that I haven't stuck in me what used to be my fat face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the app is so powerful? It is, you know, what we all need more of is consciousness, isn't it? We all need to be more yeah. conscious yeah. instead of just letting our mind unconsciously take us in old patterns and so what that app is brilliant for is just bring into consciousness you yeah. can it doesn't take away your choice it just makes you conscious about your choice and that right. idea of i don't want to reset my app to zero ah, I don't exactly want, that. and the other thing is for me i think of will i find it as easy not to miss it if i drink this now and yeah. and is it worth it no it's not is it exactly. worth it or is Different, it just, what just going to be comfortable. Well, well, on that subject, um, there's some brilliant podcasts. The one, the one, uh, it's Claire Pooley, and uh, there's a the, remember the girl called uh, Jenny Lee Grace. Yes, uh, Jenny Lee. Je yeah. I've asked to so, be on her podcast actually. Oh, well, just she's come, brilliant. Just come back yeah. to me and said, "Yes, I just need to book you in." Do it. Get on there. Uh, she um she says some wonder. I listen to her podcast. Well, she's done loads of books as well. I I didn't realize until I started following her on the Sober social. Club. Yeah, Sober Club. Yeah, she she was a backing singer in Wham. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then obviously she was on the Steve Wright in the Afternoon show for all them years as well. It it was when I was listening to one of her podcasts. I, thought, I was thinking, why do I know that voice? That voice sounds so familiar. So then one day she said, oh, yeah, but when we did the Steve, now that's it. She was on the, the, the fun facts or factoids, whatever they were yes. called. Yes, yeah. yeah. But she um, she, she always says on, on, on some of her stuff that just because you stop drinking, life doesn't really, well, it does change, it gets better. She's, uh, but going out with your friends, just carry on doing what you're doing. Don't, don't change the recipe, just change the ingredient. Yes, that's a brilliant Take away thing. the Take away the booze and put in a zero percent Guinness or a whatever, and and you still have the same amount of fun. But it's even more fun. It's just so much more fun. So I know now, and I still go and drop in the club not that often. I must add, normally I'm doing something more productive with my time now. But when I do pop in there, it's probably going to make me sound like a conceited bozo, but it's <laughs> true. So I'm going to say it. When I, as I'm entering the door. I know where they're going to be and I know who's going to be hung over and drunk 
talking the same stuff they were talking last Saturday. So I'll pop in and say hi and have a little chat. And then I get abuse from one of the guys. I won't name him. I won't even name what he does because everyone will know who it is. Oh, are you still not drinking? You're no fun. <laughs> so just, you've never been fun. You're not fun. <laughs> I, I think you've never been fun sober or drunk. At least I've got a fighting chance because I and yeah. I can drive home afterwards yeah. to get away from you. <laughs> and that's what I love as well is that being able to leave somewhere anytime you like and everything, the world is, everything's much freer, isn't it? But um, it is. yeah, it's true. Uh, uh, one of the things I used to do for years and I've stopped doing it now is saying to people and say, oh, we'll go for a glass of wine instead of just saying, yes, that'd be lovely. And then ordering something that I want when I'm there. I used to say, oh, I don't drink, which meant that they stopped inviting me because I don't drink. Right. Yeah. So now I think everybody knows I don't drink because I bloody told them. But so, um, you get used to it after a while. And, you, and it's interesting that um, your groups, I've noticed this. So you, you're, you're the, the people that you used to, and this is me I'm talking about, the people that I used to be surrounded with and associated with has changed. Mm. And your true friends, they're around. What's the saying? Um, those that matter don't mind. And those that mind don't matter. don't matter. Oh, it's so true. Exactly. So yeah, you find, I find myself operating in, in a different way now. But boy, oh boy, it's so much better. And I remember when I was at, um, and this is for anybody that's thinking that they might want to stop, I guess. So I was... Um, away on holiday it, well it was so it was more of a it was a juicy mountain which is a juicing retreat and oh. um, so everybody had gone they were like saying oh I can't wait to have a glass of wine and somebody else was saying oh I might try and give it up for a month or and I would say and, this, and I would say well I've done it and it's easy what they would then do that I think would trip them up is they start thinking well I work I've got to drink because I'm at that wedding or I'm going to that and I can't imagine yeah. not drinking that'll be really hard so they started future projecting difficulty. Setting the failure. It's that yeah. mindset again, isn't yeah. it? Instead Planning. of just thinking, I'm just going to be in the now. I'm just going to go and be in the now. And you can only ever make a decision in the moment. You can't make a decision in advance because I'm a big believer in checking yeah. in with yourself and thinking, does this still feel right for me? What do I want? Um, oh, darling, we could talk. And I think we should do. I've enjoyed that. An, an episode two. And I think we will focus on episode two on mindset. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Creating a meant for more future proof mindset because I love your, um, I love your disciplines around the mind and how you use it as a natural default. Um, is there anything that we've not mentioned that you hope that we would? Well, I think there's a couple of things if if there's time for it. And this is not promoting anything that I do business wise, but I think it's important that um, so military stuff, obviously close to my heart, always has been. And, I, and I'm I've remained involved, but in a helping out capacity. So I mentioned right at the get go, it's all about people. It's all about teams. And, it, and if you do lots for others, you find you get it back tenfold in, in a way. And, and that in many many different ways so a couple of things that i currently do with a good friend of mine darren sutton he we we organize a dinner a royal army medical corps reunited dinner every two years we did one this year in coventry we were already planning for 2026 back at the same place britannia hotel in coventry um and that was born out of a guy dying a guy called mick mccran rest in peace lovely lovely fella he he used to run all the dinners and he became known as the man to go. So if you wanted to know, oh, where do you remember Johnny from Three Armoured Field Ambulance? Where's he now? Mick would go, oh, he lives at, I need to know his address, phone number, national insurance number, his wife's name, what size shoe she's got on. He, he doesn't, Mr. RAMC knew everything, but he died. And so there was this big void. And so... Daz and I took over the dinner. So we organised the dinner, mm. which, is, which is great. And we had, 200 of people there in um, April this year and it'll be oversubscribed in 26 because it went so well it was awesome so part of this medic zone thing and this is a free thing for military people we're gonna it's like a coordination of what's going on in the army world predominantly the Royal Army Medical Corps which I was part of for 15 years 
And there's a section in there, always free, totally free. So I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, um, where people can come and put the details in, tell us about events, tell us about reunions and gatherings and socials, sadly obituaries. There's always loads. Sadly, that's just mm -hmm. the end of it. You know, there's always loads of people checking out. But when when Mick passed away, he was also the main coordinator of all things funeral. So I thought, well, we can't, that can't be a hole. We can't have a hole there. That's so important. Uh, people need to know when their mates that they were in the Gulf War with or Bosnia with or the Falk, they need to know when they're not around anymore and they mm. want to go and pay their respects. So there's a place in Medic Zone called the Military Zone where we can put all these events and, and obituaries and links to the webcasts for those all around the world. So I think that's a really important thing to me. Can you send me up. the link? I will, yeah. It's kicking off next week. We had the final meeting yesterday with these web designers. Final testing this weekend. Boom. Going live next week. That's very special. Mm. It is. It's really mm. good. Yeah. Mm. That's amazing, darling. Thank you so much. Anything else? No, that's all good. We're cooking on gas. I've loved this conversation. I've oh, it's been really good fun, actually. I've really enjoyed it. And I, I, I won't 